So today's video is going to be another serial killer, true crime, unsolved video this time. I haven't done an unsolved case in so long. But if you follow me on Twitter, you will have seen a couple of days ago that I just found out that this case is real. You're all gonna think I'm so stupid. I thought that this case was a myth. I thought that this was just a story and that the Axeman of New Orleans never existed. I thought it was just a thing on American Horror Story. I'm stupid, I know. But then I found out it was real and I was like, okay, so I've got to do that now. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, today's video is on the Axeman of New Orleans. He has never been identified. This was over a century ago now. By the way, thank you so much for 600k. I literally just hit it, like... 10 minutes ago, so thank you so much, that's insane. I know I still owe you the 500k special, that's just because my life has been so hectic this summer, like I haven't even had chance to keep up with my normal schedule, never mind five extra videos. So I'm gonna make that six. Should I just make it a week? I'm just gonna make it a week. Seven straight videos, sometime soon. I'm not gonna give you a date because my life is still pretty hectic until the end of August, so I don't know when I can give you that, but there's gonna be a week straight of videos at some time. <laughs> By the way, this intro is going to be quite long because I've got a few things to say. This chair has suddenly got really squeaky. This is the chair that I have used for the past like over a year. It's suddenly really squeaky. So I'm sorry if you can hear that. But yeah, one last thing before we get into this video. I just want to thank our sponsor June's Journey for sponsoring this video. June's Journey is a thrilling murder mystery mobile game app where you play as June and you try and solve the murder of your own sister. The game is set in the 1920s so the aesthetics are really really cute and you basically take part in a bunch of hidden object scenes to help further you in the search for your sister's killer. It's such a relaxed game to play and by that I mean it's like just the right amount of challenging where it's getting your brain going but it's not stressful. And right now on the app they are running a competition named June's Journey Hidden Talents where you basically send in a short video of you showcasing your hidden talent. There'll be five winners of this contest and each person will win a week-long luxury holiday in Berlin. And as part of that trip you get to go to the June's Journey headquarters in Berlin and like meet the team. The competition will be running until August 9th. All the details are pinned at the top of the June's Journey Facebook page if you need reminding of anything. And of course I'll leave the link down in the description to go and download June's Journey. It's available on iPhone and on Android. So what are you waiting for? Go enter that competition, win your trip to Berlin. But yeah, back to me in a green top. <laughs> Let's get into the video. Yeah, like I said in the beginning of this video, the Axeman of New Orleans was never identified. So everything you're about to hear in this video, oh, I haven't done my usual disclaimer. I'm all over the place. I'm just too excited about hitting 600K. I'd just like to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. But yeah, a lot of the information that you're about to hear in this case is from survivors of the Axeman and he had quite a lot of survivors. He actually killed as many people as he attacked that survived. So he had six kills, six survivors. But that's kind of disputed. Wait until we get into it. Some of them might not be his kills. He might have even more than that. Who knows? So this case takes place in New Orleans in Louisiana in 1918 and 1919. And the first murder accredited to the Axeman of New Orleans was on May 23rd, 1918. The first victims of the Axeman were a married Italian couple named Joseph and Catherine Maggio. The couple actually owned like a grocery shop and they lived in the apartment above that and in the middle of the night while they were asleep the killer snuck in they broke in through their back door or whatever they must have chiseled off the bottom panel of the door and snuck in and slit both of their throats while they were asleep Catherine's was actually slit so deeply that her head was almost completely severed but the axe man wasn't even done there. He then went and found an axe, the couple's own axe that they kept in their house, and he took it back to the bedroom and hacked them both multiple times. Some people believe that he did this, like he went back and got another weapon and came back because he kind of wanted to mess up his victims a little bit more. Like he didn't want their cause of death to be really easily identifiable. So if they had multiple injuries, it'll take police a bit longer. But other people believe that this man was obviously just a sicko and he 
wasn't done having fun yet. He wanted to do more to these victims before he left. The couple were found around 4.30am that night, two hours after they were actually attacked. And it was Joseph's brothers, Jake and Andrew, that found them both. These brothers, Jake and Andrew, actually happened to live next door to the Magios but somehow they didn't hear any of this attack take place. They just heard groaning two hours later when the Magios were dying. Anyway, the brothers heard these noises, went to their brother's house where they walked in, they found Catherine already dead. Like I said, her injuries were horrendous. And Joseph was laid on the bed beside her, clinging to life. He was almost dead as well. The brothers called the police, they called an ambulance and everything. However, it was too late and Joseph died literally within minutes of his brothers arriving. That's kind of one little nice thing that you can take from this. He survived for two hours alone in that room, but then his brothers came and he was able to die with them which is still really sad but it's kind of you know so police arrived at the scene they did their first initial look round at everything and immediately they found a pile of blood soaked clothes that the killer hadn't even tried to hide at all so it seemed as though the killer had killed this couple and then just taken all his clothes off put some new ones on clean ones and just left and left such huge evidence in the apartment. Outside the Maggio's home they also found the axe that still had blood on it and then a few houses down they also found the razor that was used to slash their throats that also still had their blood on it. So it was like the axe man tried to kind of hide them but not hide them he wanted them to be found and the axe that was used on the Maggio's I can't remember if I said this earlier but it was their own axe and this is a running theme with the axe man which I think is one of the most like distinctive and sadistic things about this case is that the axe man would break into their houses and use their own weapons to kill them. So anyway, police continued to look around this house and they found where the axe man had broken in. Like I said, he chiseled away the bottom panel in the door and he must have kind of like snuck in through that. I don't know how big these panels were in the door, but later on in this case, it's implied that they weren't that big. So it was very clearly a break in. It's not like the axe man had been let in or anything like that. Like he'd broken his own way in. However, nothing was stolen. Nothing was ransacked in the apartment. It seemed as though this person had broken in with the intention of killing the couple. So police really struggled to find a motive for this murder. Obviously it wasn't a robbery gone wrong. The couple posed no threat to their killer at all. They were obviously asleep. They were in bed when they were attacked. Obviously, whoever did this just wanted to kill them. They broke in there to kill them. So police began looking at Joseph and Catherine's lives, like their personal lives, people in their lives to see if they had any disagreements, any enemies, anyone that might benefit from them being gone. And the first place they decided to look were the first two people on the scene after this attack took place, Joseph's brothers, Jake and Andrew but specifically one of the brothers. Andrew Maggio actually owned a barber shop a couple of streets away from where they lived, meaning he had access to a lot of different razors because obviously they trim men's beards and things like that. But one of Andrew's employees remembers Andrew taking home this one specific razor a couple of days before the murders. Apparently Andrew wanted to sharpen this specific razor and so he took it home and then coincidentally it was used in a murder. And another suspicious thing about this whole murder and how they were found and everything is that these two brothers lived next door to the murder scene where someone will have been hacking at these two people there will have been screams there will have been a lot of banging a lot of noise however it didn't work either of them even though they were just in the next apartment but the thing that did wake the brothers was groaning noises two hours later and those groaning noises will have just been coming from Joseph Maggio because his wife was already dead. So how were the groaning noises louder than the actual attack? So obviously police brought this up with Andrew Maggio. They were saying, look, this is really suspicious. Can you explain why you didn't wake up at the attack? And he said it was because he'd actually been out drinking that night because he'd just been accepted into the Navy. He went out celebrating, got really, really drunk, came home and just pretty much like passed out in bed. And then that must have been when the attack was going on. So obviously all these loud noises wouldn't wake up someone so intoxicated. 
However, at 4.30am he woke up for a drink and that was when he heard the noises. And to be fair, it does make sense. So obviously police had no real evidence to say that Andrew did this. It was all just kind of suspicion around him and so they couldn't really arrest him and some of the things could kind of be argued so yes he did own that specific razor that was used to attack his brother and his brother's wife but he also owned a lot of the razors in the town if that makes sense so like yes he owned that specific razor but if someone was to come into his shop and steal that razor with the intention of killing Joseph Maggio and Catherine Maggio, then it's still Andrew's razor, but someone else used it. You know what I mean? And yes, his employee saw him taking home that specific razor, but how can he be sure it was that specific razor? Because like, pretty much all razors look the same. I don't know about this one in particular, but like, a razor's a razor. Or maybe this was Joseph Maggio's own razor. Think about it. If you wanted a razor at home to be able to trim your own beard, where are you going to get that razor from? Obviously your brother that owns a barber shop and has a bunch of razors. It's not like it was Andrew's personal possession, it was just a razor that Andrew had bought. It's not like it had Andrew's bloody initials engraved in it or something. It was just a razor that he owned. I don't know if that's making much sense, but it's up to you whether you consider that evidence or not. So another piece of evidence that I just want to talk about quickly before I move on. I just want to warn you, I don't know how accurate this is at all. I saw it in some sources, but a couple of blocks away from where this murder took place, there was a note left on a wall written in blood. And it supposedly said, Mrs. Maggio will sit up late tonight, just like Mrs. Tony. Now, I don't know who Mrs. Tony is. A lot of the sources that I found didn't know who Mrs. Tony is. It seemed as though if this was a real piece of evidence, it didn't make much sense at the time or now. That note isn't really talked about much at all through the rest of the case, so I don't know if it was ever connected to anything, if it was even real, who knows? Because this is such a famous case, it's got a lot of like Chinese whispers things added into it, you know what I mean? But say this was true, how could this note have been written blocks away from the house in blood? It's quite a long note and like, forgive me for how graphic this is, but he would have literally had to like bottle some blood from the crime scene and take it blocks away. Like, how has he got that much blood on his clothes that he can write a note on a wall that long? Like, fair enough if it was just one word, like, you could maybe, like, use some of the blood that's on your t-shirt or something from the attack. I don't know. I just, I don't think I believe that piece of evidence. It's up to you if you believe it. And just the fact that it's not spoken about in every single source also makes me doubt it. So yeah, with lack of evidence to be able to convict or even charge Andrew Maggio with the murder of his own brother, they had to let him go and they carried on looking for leads and looking for different suspects. But it wasn't long before they had another case on their hands to worry about. Just over a month after the first killings, on June 27th, 1918, the Axeman claimed a further two victims. This time it was a man named Louis Bessemer and his mistress Harriet Lowe. Her name's actually Harriet Ann Lowe, so you might know her as Anne if you've looked into this case. Louis owned a bakery and he and his mistress Harriet were asleep in bed in his apartment above this bakery. Very similar to the first one. The following morning, a delivery man came to drop off some ingredients at this bakery and he knocked on the door but no one answered. And this was very unusual. This was a day when the bakery was supposed to be open. Louis Bessemer always opened the door to him. And so he decided to go around the back of the bakery to see if he could drop them off. And that was when he saw a panel of the door had been chiseled out. So this delivery man pushed open the door and walked to the living quarters where Louis and Harriet were asleep. And as soon as he opened the door, there was just blood everywhere, all over the walls, all over the floor, even on the ceiling. And he made his way to the bedroom where he walked in and found Louis Bessemer and Harriet Lowe laying on the bed in pools of their own blood. And they were both still alive, but only just. They needed help immediately, otherwise they weren't gonna survive. They'd both been struck in the head just once each with an axe. Of course, police and an ambulance were called, Louis and Harriet were taken to hospital, and as police began to look around the apartment, they found Louis Bessemer's own axe 
covered in blood in the bathroom. Again, the axe man had used the victim's own weapon on them. Meanwhile, in hospital, both Louis and Harriet were being treated. Louis's injuries were a lot less severe than Harriet's. Harriet was in and out of consciousness. She needed a lot of treatment, a lot of surgeries. And so it was gonna take a while for her to be able to give her story to police. However, they were able to talk to Louis pretty much immediately. But unfortunately, Louis wasn't gonna be much help to the investigation because he said that they were just both asleep when they were attacked. So he woke up as he was being attacked but just to see the figure running away, he couldn't get a good look at his face or anything like that. Literally all Louis Bessemer said was that it was a dark looming figure, so police didn't really have much to go on. Like I said, Louis Bessemer was able to fully recover from his injuries and he became the first ever survivor of the Axeman. However, his mistress Harriet Lowe wasn't so lucky and she actually passed away after seven weeks of treatment. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but while Louis and Harriet were being treated for their injuries in hospital, police actually went ahead and arrested a suspect. This suspect was a 41-year-old black man that worked at Louis Bessemer's bakery, and I think it's very important to note his race here because the only reason that police arrested this man, or the only reason that they could really give was that he worked at Louis Bessemer's bakery and so he was close to him, knew where he was gonna be at all times, knew that he could attack him in the middle of the night. But they didn't arrest any of Louis's other workers, the other white workers or the other Italian workers, just the one black man that worked there. It was a very racist time. This was a racist thing to do. They had no evidence against this man. They arrested him because he was an easy target. They kept him for a while with absolutely no evidence. They were probably trying to find evidence against him. They probably just wanted someone to lock up and they just thought that they would blame this innocent black man. However, they couldn't find any evidence, obviously, because this man was innocent and so they had to let him go. This part's getting a little bit confusing. I understand that. But Harriet Lowe, before she passed away, she passed away after seven weeks of treatment. And during that seven weeks, she was like in and out of consciousness, in and out of surgery. And while she was awake, police would go in and question her. And her series of events was very confusing. At first, she claimed that the attacker was a mixed race man. She used a racist term for that, so we can assume that she meant it in a racist way, but then she changed her mind. She decided that the attacker was actually Louis Bessemer himself. She told police that Louis Bessemer was a German spy and he'd never told her this before, but somehow she got wind of it. She realized that he was a German spy and so she confronted him about it and that is when he attacked her with the ax and then attacked himself with the ax to cover it up. So police decided to look into this theory and they found some evidence. <laughs> just a couple of letters in his house written in different European languages. Louis Bessemer was arrested but he was released very quickly after and the police that arrested him for being a German spy were actually demoted because they did a bad job because he wasn't a German spy and that's a really serious accusation to make against someone. After speaking with Harriet Lowe again, police were trying to get a little bit more evidence on Louis Bessemer. They just wanted someone to lock up for this because they wanted to be seen to be doing their job. And after Harriet Lowe passed away, police decided to arrest Louis Bessemer for murder because now Harriet was dead. Before it would have been attempted murder, but as soon as she passed away, that is when they arrested him. He actually spent nine months in jail before he was finally acquitted. He was found not guilty of murder after originally being found guilty of it. But yeah, after that, no one else was arrested, no other leads were found, no other suspects were found. And so now police just had two double attacks on their hands with no one to blame for them. Just over a month after that, the third Axeman attack took place on August 5th, 1918, this time on a pregnant woman. And she was alone. Now the ones before this had been in couples, she was alone. 28 year old Anna Schneider was eight months pregnant when her husband Ed came home from work one day and found her laid on their bed covered in blood. Literally, she was so covered in blood that her husband didn't even know what was wrong. He didn't even know 
where to start looking at her injuries. He just called her an ambulance and they went straight to the hospital. Her face was just so brutally beaten. There were so many wounds on her face. She was missing so many of her teeth. Her scalp was cut open. Anna was treated for these injuries and by some kind of miracle, after two days, she gave birth to her little baby girl and the baby was completely healthy. Anna also ended up surviving the attack and went on to tell police that she didn't really see her attacker. Again, she was attacked while she was asleep and then when she woke up, she just saw a dark looming figure leaving her room. Now, even though the Axeman of New Orleans, his MO seems to be using the victim's own axe on them, that doesn't seem to be how Anna was attacked. It actually seems more likely in this case that she was attacked using her bedside lamp, so she was just continually beaten with it. It seemed as though this person just kind of went into the house and found whatever they could. They seemed to prefer axes, but if they were to find a razor, they would use a razor. If they couldn't find an axe, they would use a bedside lamp, you know? So after the attack on Anna, police were kind of split depending on what they thought about these attacks. Some of them were connecting all three attacks, saying this is the same person that's done all three of these. They were all very, very similar. Whereas other officers were kind of still trying to explain away the different crimes to different people. So a lot of officers still believe that the first one was done by Andrew Maggio and that this one, because the MO was different, like the weapon used was different, they believed it was a different attacker. Around this point in the case, a man named James Gleason was arrested. However, he was let go literally just after a couple of days of his arrest. I believe the reason that James Gleason was arrested was because he saw police out and about in town or whatever and just ran. And obviously that's very suspicious. You don't just see police out and run unless you're guilty of something and you don't want police to see you. So he was taken to the police station, he was arrested, he was questioned. Obviously they didn't really find much evidence for him to be the Axeman of New Orleans. Gleason said in his questioning that the reason he ran from police that day was because he'd been in and out of jail all his life and he just learned to be scared of police. Like it was kind of second nature to him to run away because he felt like he was going to get arrested and taken to jail again. But, I mean, to me that's still a sign of a guilty person. Anyway, they couldn't find any evidence for him being the axe man and so he was just let free to do whatever else he was doing, whatever that was. But the next axe man attack came very quickly after the last one, just five days later on August 10th, 1918. In the early hours of the morning, Pauline and Mary Bruno were awoken to noises coming from their uncle's room. They walked in to find their uncle, Joseph Romano, slumped on the floor in a pool of his own blood after he'd been attacked in the head with an axe. Some sources even say that the girls witnessed their uncle's attacker fleeing the scene. Now, I don't know how true this is, but I do have a quote. I don't exactly I don't know where this quote is from that's why I'm saying quote but the girls supposedly described this attacker fleeing the scene as a dark-skinned heavy-set man who wore a dark suit and a slouched hat so this person if we're going by their account this person was going around murdering people in a suit again an axe was found in the back garden of the property and a panel had been chiseled out of the door so that someone could gain access. 80 year old Joseph Romano did fight his injuries for two days, however he eventually passed away in hospital. At this point police couldn't deny that these attacks were probably connected because there were just far too many similarities. The panel being chiselled out of the door, the axe being found on the lawn, it was all just too similar for it to not be the same person. And so they decided to make it very vocal that they were looking for the person that was doing this. It was all over newspapers and everything like that that police were stepping up their security. They had people going out and patrolling at nights and days, like people were on different road corners and things. Everyone knew that the police were doing quite a lot to find this person and it was going to be kind of hard for the Axeman to attack again. And because of the kind of hysteria around this case, a lot of members of the public were phoning in false stories, false sightings of the Axeman. A lot of people said they would see different men with axes lurking around in the neighbourhoods and so they would call the police, police would turn up, no one would be there. Realistically, at this point, I think the Axeman 
realised how tight the police were being and how unlikely he was to get away with a crime at this time and so he just stepped back and he waited until police gave up. The Axe Man actually waited a full nine months and obviously by then there was less security around, like obviously there hadn't been a random murder in nine months. So police were beginning to think that they'd cracked this and that the Axe Man had given up or something, but no, he struck again. On March 10th, 1919, a neighbour of the Cortemiglia family heard screams coming from their house and so this neighbour ran across the street to check. This neighbour entered the home to find Rose Cortemiglia, the mother of the family, stumbling into the hallway, blood all over her head, and she was clutching her deceased infant child. The child's name was Mary, she was two years old, and she was killed in her mother's arms. So Rose and Mary were both laid on the bed, they were asleep, and this attacker had come in and struck this child just once on the neck and killed her instantly. I assume Rose was attacked around the same time. She was struck just once in the head with an axe and Rose's husband Charles was collapsed on the floor in a pool of his own blood with similar head injuries to that of his wife Rose. The couple were rushed to hospital and their wounds were treated and luckily they survived. However, of course, their two-year-old daughter Mary didn't. And a lot of people believe that that drove Rose Cartamiglia to insanity. Once she was all like physically healed, she began having her police questionings and everything where they asked like if she saw her attacker and things like that. And that was when Rose told them that it was actually the neighbor that attacked her. That neighbor that came in and found them bleeding, it was him. But this neighbor was a 69 year old man and he was very, ill, very frail, he could not have even lifted an axe, never mind committed such an attack. And when police told Rose that, when they were like, we really don't think it was him, she said, well, no, it was his son as well then. She began accusing his son, Frank, who was, I think he was 18 years old. He was six foot and 200 pounds. So he was quite a big guy and police, again, didn't believe her. The reason I tell you about his size is because, again, the killer had gotten in through a panel in the door, a very tiny little panel that they chiselled out of the door. This big six foot, 200 pound guy could not fit through that gap in the door. And the other guy was too old and too frail to be able to do that. So police at this point just didn't really believe Rose and her story. Like I said, Charles Cartamiglia survived as well and he was being questioned as well. And the whole time he was completely denying Rose's version of events, he was saying, I don't know what she's talking about, that didn't happen, it wasn't him, it wasn't either of them. But police arrested the two neighbours nonetheless and they were both found guilty of attempted murder. The older of the two neighbours was sentenced to life in prison and the younger of the two neighbours, the one that they believed actually probably hit them with the axe and everything, he was sentenced to death. He was to be hanged for Rose's accusations. So the men went to trial. Obviously it was gonna be a really long trial. This was before they were sentenced and everything. And about a year into this trial, Charles Cortemiglia divorced his wife, Rose, because after this whole thing, she just wasn't the same. She was insane, as he, as he put it. He just couldn't believe that she was saying these things about the neighbors because he was there. He saw the attackers. Obviously he didn't see their face, but he knew it wasn't his neighbours. And I think it must have been like the divorce to kind of snap Rose back to reality because she went to the police and admitted that they were all false accusations and that neither of the neighbours were there that night. Luckily, the younger of the two neighbours hadn't been sentenced to death yet and the other one was only gonna serve life in prison anyway and so they were both let free. But anyway, we've skipped forward quite a lot there. We've skipped forward a full year. So let's go right back to that attack, the last attack of the Cartamiglias. Just three days after that, a newspaper received the infamous letter from the Axeman himself. And you know at the top of the page where the sender will put like a return address, like their own address, so that if the letter gets lost, it can go back to them. Well, the Axeman just simply wrote, hell. So I'm just gonna read you a few of the like main bits from this letter because the Axeman liked to ramble quite a lot. <laughs> and a lot of it doesn't really make much sense to me anyway, because I've got like three brain cells. It started with esteemed mortal of New Orleans, the Axeman. They have never caught me and they never will. 
They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit, and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep me company. He then basically went on to say that the police are stupid and they're never going to catch him and they're following all the wrong leads and everything, but he said it in a lot of words, <laughs> so I'm just summarising. He goes on to say that he could kill every single night if he wanted to, but he was just kind of being nice. And now I'm going back to quoting it. He says, now to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I'm very fond of jazz music and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then so much better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. And then he signed it off with the axe man. Now, of course, it obviously can't be proven that this letter was actually from the Axe Man. A lot of people believe that this letter is a hoax. After all, the Axe Man was a famous and feared serial killer at this point. Everyone in New Orleans knew who he was. They were terrified that he was coming for them next. And it's not unusual to see people write hoax letters just to get a rise out of the public in cases like this. I mean, it doesn't really happen as much these days. But like in the Jack the Ripper case, a lot of people believe a lot of those letters were hoaxes. Mm. <laughs> but just the concept of the threat in the letter just makes it seem like a joke. Like, play jazz music and I won't kill you. Like, that, that seems like a joke. Especially that specific phrase, people who do not jazz it out will get the axe. It's just like hard to take it seriously, don't you think? So yes, it could be a hoax, but at the same time, Think about it this way, okay, so a person that can commit such murders, like killing literally an infant with an axe, they must be like mentally ill in some capacity. And to a mentally ill person, this letter might not sound like a joke, like this might sound really threatening to someone that's not all there, you know what I mean? So who knows, maybe it is a hoax, but also this could be his version of like a really scary letter and he could think that he's really scaring everyone in New Orleans. And to be fair, he did. And they all followed his instructions. The next Tuesday came around and pretty much every single home that owned a record player was playing jazz music. Obviously, even if you thought it was a hoax, you wouldn't take that risk. There were some houses that did take the risk and to be fair, I think it was more like, let's try and catch the ax man kind of thing. Like if they're not playing jazz music, someone might come and break in their house and then they'll be able to catch this person that's been attacking people. But yeah, people that didn't have record players were going to like different jazz clubs and like community centers, like every single jazz band in New Orleans was booked for that night. And on that night, March 19th of 1919, there was no Axeman attack. In fact, there was no further attacks for months. <laughs> Everyone thought that the Axeman had given up again, but of course he hadn't. And five months later, on August 10th of 1919, a man named Steve Boker awoke in his bed to a dark figure looming over him with an ax. Literally, as soon as Steve's eyes opened, he was struck by this ax. So he didn't really get to see anything and then he was knocked unconscious for a couple of hours. When he finally came round, he realised that he was in a lot of pain, and so he managed to stagger out of his house and to a neighbour's house across the street, and once he got there, he just collapsed. He must have used the rest of his energy. This neighbour found Steve outside, managed to call an ambulance and get him to the hospital, but when police came to question him, Steve didn't remember anything, obviously. The blows to the head must have just completely knocked him out and made him not remember a single thing. He didn't even remember being attacked. He didn't know he'd been attacked by an axe. 
police I believe just kind of theorised that he had because it fit the other attacks. But Steve actually sustained some of the worst injuries in this whole case. His skull was completely cracked open, apparently you could see his brain. Of course, I don't know how accurate all of this is, but this is what I found online. As with the other Axeman attacks, Steve's house had been carefully broken into, the bottom panel had been chiselled away from the door, there was nothing stolen in his house. This seemed like a signature Axeman attack. And the next attack took place again very quickly after this one, just three weeks later in early September. 19 year old Sarah Lawman was attacked in her sleep after the axe man had climbed into her house through an open window. And this attack left Sarah unconscious for quite a few hours until neighbours finally came in and found her when she was almost dead. It seemed as though she'd been bludgeoned really quite badly. She was missing a lot of her teeth and her head was just covered in blood. Sarah did survive her injuries. However, she couldn't really tell police much because she was asleep when the attack started and unconscious when it ended. So she didn't see anything. As with the other Axeman attacks, an ax was found on Sarah's front lawn. However, there is some doubt surrounding this particular attack because the killer didn't break in through the door. He let himself in through an open window. I mean, maybe he did just see a big gaping open window and thought, well, it's easier to just let myself in through there rather than sit and try and chisel away the back panel on a door. So maybe he did just let himself in through there and give up his normal MO. Or maybe this was a copycat killing, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. But the final Axeman attack happened two months after this one on October 27th of 1919. Esther Peppertone awoke in the middle of the night hearing noises coming from her bedroom. I believe she'd fallen asleep on the couch or something like that. So she ran to the bedroom where her husband was asleep and she stood in the doorway and witnessed two men fleeing the scene. Now some sources say she saw two men, some sources say she saw just the one man, but most of them say two men, so I'm gonna take that one as what she said. Her husband had been attacked by these two men. His name was Mike Peppertone and he'd been struck in the head with an axe 18 times and there was just blood everywhere all over this room. When police arrived at the scene, Mike was already dead, obviously. He had 18 blows to the head with an axe. He wasn't gonna survive that. However, police noted that his wife, Esther, seemed very calm. She wasn't hysterical, she wasn't scared, she wasn't too upset to say her husband had just been killed in front of her. And this particular attack just seems a little bit off to me. I mean, seeing two people flee in the scene when there's never been two people before in these attacks. It seems to line up quite well with a copycat killing because as well, none of the other victims had quite so many axe wounds. All the others were just struck like once or twice, maybe three times, but never 18 times. So if the last two killings both seem a little bit off, then the likelihood is that maybe the axe man stopped before the last two and these last two that we accredit to the axe man aren't actually the axe man and maybe they're just copycat killings. Some sources say that another weapon was used that night, apparently something used to put up circus tents with and there was a circus in town at the time of this murder so a lot of people believe that it was someone other than the axe man that did this. Some people have pointed out that Esther Peppertone seems a little bit suspicious and you're gonna see a little bit more later on that she seems more suspicious. Did that make sense? Absolutely not. Esther seems quite suspicious. Her demeanor when her husband died and police got there was a little bit off and then something you're gonna find out later adds to that suspicion. Other people believe that this murder, the last one specifically of Mike Peppertone, was actually a mafia killing. Mike Peppertone's father had killed a man in the past. I don't know much about that at all. However, it is believed that the mafia then wanted revenge on the Peppertone family, and so they went and attacked him. And that would explain why there were two men this time, because, I mean, I've never been attacked by the mafia before, don't plan on it, please don't come after me. But with them being such like a tight group, it wouldn't surprise me that they would go in twos to attack someone because that would mean that they would definitely overpower them, definitely kill them. And maybe if it was a mafia killing, maybe they just took an ax and used an ax 
to try and cover it up to make it look like an Axeman killing because they were going on at the time so perfect time to kill someone and try and get away with it isn't it really and like I said before he was struck 18 times whereas all the other people were struck like twice so they were definitely making sure that Mike Peppertone was dead this time whereas the Axeman never really did that actually that's something that really confuses me about this case I wonder if the Axeman ever really cared about killing people maybe he just wanted to attack and scare and maybe he wanted to keep survivors so that they could tell the story and keep his name in the news. I don't know, that's just something strange about the Axeman. He never really made sure that they were dead and I, he probably would if he wanted to. But that didn't happen with Mike Pepperton. So again, that makes me think that it wasn't an Axeman killing. And just like that, the Axeman stopped killing or maybe he stopped killing before that and they were just copycats. Who knows, maybe the Axeman carried on elsewhere or maybe he changed his MO and carried on killing but no one knew it was the Axeman. Whatever the reason for the end of the Axeman killings, police never found out who he was. They had literally no leads, obviously DNA evidence wasn't a thing then. They had nothing. They never found him. They never had any decent suspects i mean we're going to talk about a couple but it's like and so because they have no like leads or anything they decided to try and think of a motive because then that might lead to a suspect it didn't seem as though the axe man ever really had a motive they weren't robberies gone wrong it seemed as though he was literally just breaking in these places to attack because he wanted to, like, for what reason? So police looked at the victims of the Axeman and they all seemed to fit a particular pattern. They all seemed to be Italian immigrants or Italian Americans and a lot of them had businesses, like they were quite successful people. So maybe the Axeman did have a motive after all, maybe, maybe he was racist, maybe they were racially motivated. So of course we have a lot of theories in this case, copycat killings, mafia killings, racially motivated killings, but now we're going to talk about one suspect in particular, a man named Joseph Mumfrey. Now this whole situation from now on is a little bit confusing, so stick with me as well as you can. So the last believed killing of the Axeman was Mike Pepperton. His wife, Esther Pepperton, found him dead, saw two men fleeing the scene. Well, about a year later, Esther Pepperton moved to LA and remarried a man named Angela. And two years after her first husband's death, Literally, on the anniversary, two year anniversary of his death, her second husband goes missing. And not long after her second husband goes missing, a man turns up on her doorstep. A man that had done business with her second husband multiple times, a man named Joseph Mumfrey. However, he wasn't coming to just check on Esther. It wasn't like a nice little visit. It was actually quite hostile. He opened the door and demanded that Esther give him $500 and all of her jewellery. Now, Esther was very smart in this situation. She didn't panic, she said, okay, let me go get my jewellery. She goes to get her jewellery and comes back with a revolver and shoots Joseph Mumfrey to death. So, of course, Esther Pepperton is arrested for this murder. She's taken to the police station. She's gonna be in prison for a long, long time. And they questioned her and they said, well, why did you do it? Like, why did you kill him? And she said, because that is the man that killed my husband. So all the way back when Esther claimed to have seen those two men that night, one of them was Joseph Mumfrey, but she'd never told the police that before. But they decided to look into Joseph Mumfrey a little bit more and they found that he had a lengthy criminal record. He was part of a gang, a blackmailing gang, I believe. I don't, I don't really know what that is. It sounds like a gang, but like not that much crime. And this gang that he was a part of specifically targeted Italians, which lines up with the Axeman so well. Because a lot of people in New Orleans at this time, a lot of white people were very racist towards Italians and of course black people. It was like some horrible hierarchy of different nationalities and races and just so many different layers of people that thought they were better than other people because of certain features or certain things about them. It was horrible. But like I said, he had a very lengthy criminal record. He was in this gang. He was in and out of prison all his adult life. And the times when he was out of prison, 
seem to perfectly line up with the Axeman killings. Although that is kind of the only evidence that anyone ever has against Joseph Mumfrey and it's very circumstantial, I think it's quite interesting how well it lines up. One interesting thing to note about this case is that the Axeman could have so many more victims than we've even talked about right now. So the ones that we've talked about so far in this video have all been official cases that are officially attributed to the Axeman. These are the ones that I'm about to talk about are not official, which is why I've left it until the end, although a lot of people believe that the Axeman did commit these ones as well. And they could be another link to Joseph Mumfrey because these ones that I'm about to talk about happened in 1910 and 1911, some of them in the beginning of 1912 as well, I believe. And then in 1912, Mumfrey went to prison for seven years until 1918, and then he got out and coincidentally, that is the same time that the Axeman murders began. So these murders are literally the most confusing thing I've ever read in my entire life. It took me hours to get my head around this and I still don't have my head around it. So I've simplified them as much as I possibly can. I try not to drop details in my true crime videos, but literally if I can't understand it, how am I supposed to tell it? You know what I mean? So this is very simplified, so I'm sorry about that. Between 1910 and 1912, Five or six different Italian business owners were killed in different circumstances. So some of them were beaten, some of them were shot, some of them were killed in unknown circumstances. And that is a very specific group of people, Italian business owners. And I mean, there weren't too many Italian business owners at this time in New Orleans. Like I said, because of the hierarchy and stuff, all the white people were on the top. All the white people were the rich ones. Well, not all the white people, we'll get onto that in a minute. But Italian people were just kind of coming up at this time. They were just building empires for themselves. This was when they were really starting to like find their feet in New Orleans. And like I said, at this time in New Orleans, the white people were very racist to literally everyone that wasn't a white person. Just different people, just people that weren't from New Orleans. They didn't like them. Anyone that came in that was not there already, they didn't like them. And so these Italian immigrants were coming in and they were outdoing the white people completely. They were becoming more successful, they were more hardworking, they were starting their own businesses, building their own empires, they were becoming really successful citizens. And the white people didn't like that because they were doing better than them and the white people always thought that they were the best. And so the theory is that the axe man was a jealous white man and he was racist and he didn't like that these Italian immigrants were being really successful in his city and so he went about killing them. But at the same time, some of these killings between 1910 and 1912 can have other explanations. Some of them are believed to have been mafia killings. Some of them are believed to have been like personal disputes, like genuinely explained by a fight with a friend or something and they killed each other. I mean, it's up to you what you believe. It's a very specific like, you know, demographic of people to all have been killed in such a short space of time. And that's something about all the confirmed Axeman victims as well. They were pretty much all Italian immigrants. So now we're going to talk about our last suspect in this case. He is an unofficial suspect. So he's not talked about quite as much as Joseph Mumfrey is or, you know, like any other <laughs> suspect or theory. But this is really interesting to me. I personally don't believe it but it's really interesting. His name was Jake Bird and he was arrested in 1947, so a long, long time after the Axeman murders, because he was believed to have been responsible for a double murder and the weapon of choice was an axe. So Jake was in his 50s when he was accused of committing this double murder in the 1940s and this was 20 years after the Axeman killings. So police took Jake to the station, they were questioning him about this double murder in the 40s and then Jake tells police that he is responsible for 44 different murders in his lifetime all across America. And although he didn't confirm or deny that he was the Axeman of New Orleans, he was a teenager living in New Orleans at the time of those murders. So he was in the area. And something that I've thought throughout this case, right, Remember, remember when we were talking about the doors with the chiselled out panels and that 18 year old six foot guy couldn't fit through this little panel? Well, ever since then, I have been thinking, well, how small are these panels? Obviously, I don't know how small the panels were, but if a guy, like if a man, 
can't fit through one of them, how small was the axe man? Potentially teenager sized? That's not an official size, but you know what I mean. Jake Bird was a teenager at the time, meaning he was smaller than a man so could have potentially fit through a little door panel every time. And that's all there really is to connect Jake Bird to the Axeman killings, just that he's confessed to more murders and he was small. Um, but I do have one little piece of information about Jake Bird that I think you might find interesting. It's completely irrelevant to this case, but I'm going to tell it anyway because it's quite interesting. At his murder trial for that double murder that he was accused of, he was actually found guilty and sentenced to death. And when he was given that ruling, he stood up in court and announced that everyone in that room would die before he would. So obviously he was given a set date that he was going to be killed on and he stood up and said, everyone in this room is going to die before then. And six people out of about 10 or 12 in that room did die before he did of different like natural causes, diseases, illnesses. It was very, very weird. And a lot of people find that a little bit like spooky. I don't know, like it's just kind of interesting in it whether you believe in that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything on the Axeman of New Orleans. I hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed researching this one because I thought it was, you know, not real <laughs> the whole, my whole bloody life. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so, so much for watching. Let me know down in the comments who you think the Axeman was. Do you think it was Mumfrey? Do you think it was you know, someone else. Thanks again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Like I said, the link will be down in the description. Quick, go download the app, go enter the competition, try and win that holiday to Berlin. But yeah, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you leave a big thumbs up down below and subscribe if you want to see some more from me. I almost forgot how to say that then. A huge, huge thank you to all of my channel members. If you want to become a channel member and support me and the content and the videos that I make, you can click the link in the description or you can click the join button under the video if you're on a desktop. All channel members get access to a community tab where we can discuss cases, you can request cases and get them fast-tracked. You also get updates on my channel and upcoming videos and stuff like that. And level two channel members will get all of that that I just said, as well as their name on this end card at the end of every video. Thank you so much if you do become a member and support the channel. It really does mean the world to me. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. Subscribe to my second channel if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.